In 2002, Joseph Huffman headed a group of 32 scholars that were endeavoring to study the subject, did Jesus actually exist? It's called the Jesus Project. And among these 32 scholars, you had some that were in the belief that Jesus was a myth. They never actually existed upon this earth in a body. He never walked upon the earth. But he was the imagination of men's minds, Jews, Hellenists, Middle Easterns, that formed a, a person. And he was the myth. And some of this group believed that. They wanted to be fair. Joseph Huffman said, let's have that discussion. So what happened is that the Christ myth group, they said, we want to have our separate group in this big group. We want to acknowledge the fact we're here and we want to be looking at the things we want to look at. And Joseph Huffman said, that's getting a little too extreme on skepticism. And so he saw it going a different way, so it was not funded any longer. And it ended, 2009. What we observe is that that Christ myth group, as they have endeavored to promote their point, have exposed something among those scholars who were involved in looking at historical evidence for the existence of Christ, Jesus upon the earth. While they do not believe in the deity of Jesus, they don't believe he's the son of God, they don't believe the character of the New Testament books, they don't accept them being inspired of God, they came to understand that to ignore the evidence for historical Jesus is not scholarly, it's not being fair with the evidence, because they found them. Oh, not much, they found them. They weren't from biblical sources, because see, that's already excluded. Forget somebody who was close to Jesus to write about him, we're not going to accept that one. Because the way they look at it, which is more likely to happen? A man walking on the water, glowing like the sun, roasting the dead? Or someone rewriting miraculous stories about somebody? Which is more likely to happen? That's what that group was about. They failed to realize that Josephus, a Jew, not near Jesus, trying to set forth the history of the Jews before the Roman government to realize that they're not so bad a people. And he wrote about Jesus existing. Tacitus, who lived from either 54 to 120 B.C. or 55 to 120 A.D., not B.C., a Roman historian, he spoke about what happened in 64 A.D. I think everybody believes this. That Nero saw Rome burn to the ground. He saw burning in Rome. He kind of brought that about. Historians help us to see. But he blamed that upon the Christians. They were the scapegoats. And Tacitus writes about that that occurred in 64 A.D. But in that same writing of that history, the Christians, they were the scapegoats, they were the common people, and they were put to death for their abominable sins that they've committed. And by the way, they got their name from Christ, who in the days of Tiberius was executed by Pontius Pilate. Tacitus, a Roman historian, got an axe to grind about Jesus. He's a historian. Oh, we'll accept Nero. <laughs> we'll accept Christians. They really died. <laughs> but Christ? I ask you, is Tiberius and Pontius Pilate a figment of man's imagination today? Or are they historical figures? 
Christ died during Tiberius' reign by Pontius Pilate. And yet, skeptics believe Jesus never existed. They're wiping out his miracles. They're wiping out his ever being. That's what man wants to do with Jesus. And the question this morning is not to go into more detail of what is being revealed about Jesus from historians, that he actually existed. He came to us, but my question is why? And the Bible has some answers for us. Why did Jesus come to this earth? The first reason, and I think this will come to our mind, is that in Luke 19, 10, Jesus says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And it's an interesting account of what led him to make that statement. He was passing through Jericho. He'd already entered Jericho and healed a man born blind, or healed a man that was blind. But he enters into Jericho, and he is going to meet up with a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Depending on what off you read, Zacchaeus' name could be pure, or could be of Jehovah. But his name was Zacchaeus. I don't know if you like Zacchaeus or not, but if you like people who take your taxes, I'll probably know the answer. The Bible says he was a chief publican. He wasn't just a publican, a tax gatherer. He was the chief publican. See, they had tax farmers. Kind of want a franchise. I'll hire out men who are going to be involved in collecting taxes. And we'll do that for the Roman government, but we can ask what the traffic bears. And we'll give to Rome, but we can keep the rest of it. Do what you feel like you can get by with. And that's what the tax gatherers did. And Zacchaeus was the chief among them. Parkey tells us about what is involved in tax there, and you think you get taxed a lot. Let's, let's, let's say you've got one chariot. You've got one horse that's driving that chariot. You get out on a drive one day, and you're going to be on a road. There'll be a tax for that road. There will be a tax for your carriage. How many wheels you got on that chariot? I got more than one. Going to tax your wheels. How many axles on that thing? Going to tax your axles. I'm going to tax your donkey. That's all that you've got. Or your horse. They've taxed everything about my carriage. Do you know why people didn't like the publicans? The tax gatherers? You go up a river, they'll tax you the river. You go into the city, and they'll tax you for coming into that town. You're going to do merchandise, you're going to sell merchandise, they'll be taxed upon that merchandise. You go on a ferry, you'll be taxed on the ferry. Everywhere you turn, there were taxes, and they could get what the traffic bear. You want to get from here to there, you'll probably pay our taxes, or you, you're not going to get there. You go into this harbor, oh, and Jericho was a harbor. It was a place where a lot of things would come through, and a place for a business. And that was this man. And Jesus called him by name. Zacchaeus, come down hastily. You come quickly, because I must abide in your house today. I must abide. Why? Because... Verse 10 says, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. The chief, yeah, the chief publican and the publicans himself, Jesus is interacting with them. And he did this, but don't you know Jesus? Because they murmured at Jesus when he was going to be staying with Zacchaeus. He's going to be eating with him. This was nothing new to Jesus. Luke 15 in verse 1, all the the publicans and sinners that came to Jesus, they came, they drew near to him. He didn't drive them away. They drew near to him in Luke 15 and verse 1. In Matthew 9 and verse 9, he chose 
a tax gatherer to be his disciple who he would send out as an apostle. He would eat with him and drink with him in verses 10 and 11. And when Jesus was driving home the hard heart of the Jews, he said, publicans and harlots will enter into the kingdom before you will. Sinners, harlots, got a group there called the tax gatherer. That's what they thought of him. And now they're murmuring because he is going to abide in his house. He's going to abide in his house. Zacchaeus stands before the Lord. I give half of everything I get and I give to the poor. Really? That's what he said. And if I have exacted aught, maybe got more on that axle than I should have, more on that carriage than I should have, if I have exacted that which is wrong, I pay it back fourfold. The Greek verb there is give, it's present tense. Is that Zacchaeus? That's what he is doing now? I doubt that. If he's doing all of that and how history tells us how ungodly are and how John is telling the soldiers not to use their power to get more money out of people, I have a feeling that says, this is what I'm going to start doing now. I'll give half what I have to the poor. And what I've exacted from someone else that's wrong... I will return it fourfold. That's what the law of Moses taught. If they had an oxen, they would give fivefold. If I've done somebody wrong, fourfold. And he says, salvation, Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. For he is a son of Abraham. See, he was a Jew. He was abiding by the law. Now, I think he's showing repentance. And now Jesus says, salvation has come to this house for it's Zacchaeus has made the change. Well, Jesus, how in the world can you save? You had not died yet. Matthew 9, verses 5 and 6, Jesus had power on earth to forgive sin. And he did it a lot in his earthly ministry. He told the man that on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. He had the power to do that because he's the son of God. No contradiction here. Salvation has come. But he came to seek and to save the lost. Do you think Zacchaeus was a lost man? Forget what you think about taxes. Was he a man that probably been in sin? I think he's recognizing that. He's wanted to make a change. Yeah, he's lost. But I tell you, he wasn't so lost that he didn't know where Jesus is coming. Did you notice that? As Jesus entered into the city, Zacchaeus is wanting to meet him. So he went ahead and got where Jesus is going to come. The man was lost in sin, but he wasn't so lost that he knew where to get in order to see Jesus. Well, by the way, he was a short man. He had that figured out too. I'll be here, up here, in a sycamore tree. And he's waiting on him. Jesus calls him by name. I'm seeking him. But wasn't Zacchaeus also seeking him? And dear Christian, you and I need to be reminded, when Jesus came to this earth, we need to be reminded that the person we think, oh, their soul, you can't, you're not going to save that person. They're so far gone. They're not about to listen to the gospel. They may be at this moment sick and tired of how they're living. And yes, they're lost, but they may be wanting to find somebody that comes to their side and say, hey, can we come to your house and study the Bible today? It may be the right time. They're lost. But they've been looking at you and said, that man, that woman knows the Bible. 
I think I need to change my life. So salvation can come to their house that day. I came to seek and to save the lost. He came in the flesh to do that. We're in the flesh. Why aren't we doing that? We need to be encouraged to follow his example because if we abide in Jesus in 1 John, the second chapter, we'll walk as he walked. And this is how he walked. Seeking and saving the lost. Jesus came to this earth, secondly, to take on flesh. Virgin birth, his walk upon this earth, he took on flesh. Hebrew writer talk about flesh and blood. Why did he do that? So mankind could behold his glory. In John the first chapter in verse 14, the apostle says the word became flesh. That word in verse 1 is that indeed was God and was with God. It is God. But the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the apostles say we, and we beheld his glory Glory is of the only begotten from the Father. He is indeed uniquely coming forth from the Father. He has always been forth from the Father. In John 14 and verse 9, Philip, have, we've been, I've been so long with you that you ask, show us the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. John 14 and verse 9. You've seen the character of God. I've been walking on this earth showing you the glory of the character of God. And it wasn't a myth. A myth. It wasn't something that's just a concept. No. Remember in 1 John 1 and verse 1? That which we've seen, we've beheld, we've heard, we've touched the word of life. That's Jesus. He came in the flesh so you could get a hold of him. The apostles, we've touched him. We've heard him. We've seen him. He's called the word of life. He's he has set forth the example of being the character of God. Who convicts me of sin? They haven't yet. Oh, they, they call it blasphemy. <laughs> but he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection. They're proved to be a liar. But he took on flesh so people could see his glory. It wasn't he took on flesh so he would understand what it meant to be human. I never read that in scripture, but people say it all the time. See, it's like a, you've got to communicate to the ant. How does that ant know that I'm not going to step on him today? Well, I'll have to become an ant to let him know I really love him. Jesus had to become... A person. So he could understand what it was like to be an ant. God created us. Jesus created us. He knows us from inside out. He knows what it's like. He became flesh. So you could see his glory. And the book that he wrote so you to see that is off limits. From a skeptical world. So we're having to go to Tacitus. We're having to go to Josephus. To examine the fact they live. But this book tells you. He came for man to see his glory. He came to do God's will in the flesh. Look at Hebrews the 10th chapter. Verses 5 through 9. Sacrifices of animals. Are not going to take care of the problem of sin. It's possible that. Blood of bulls and goats could do this. But here's what came in its place. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body didst thou prepare for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I am come. And the roll of the book is written to me to do thy will, O God. Jesus, why did you come to the earth? Why did you take on this flesh? I took it on 
So I could do the will of God in the context of offering the sacrifices for the sins of the world. Bloods and bulls of ghosts couldn't do that. That's been doing that all through the Old Testament. That wasn't going to work. It never was designed to work. It was pointing toward this one who came to do his will. The Hebrew writer quotes from the Septuagint translation. That's the Greek translation of the Jewish language into Greek. The Greek speaks about the fact that a body didst thou prepare for me. When you read Psalm 46 through 8 in the Hebrew, it says, you dig my ear. You dig a body thou hast prepared for me. You're digging out his ear or piercing his ear. And that's the Hebrew. I'm not arguing that, but I want you to understand this doing the will of God in the Hebrew language becomes very powerful because in Exodus, you'll read where it, here is a slave with his master. A lot of times that was in being an indenture, you pay into debts. And you were to be the master servant for six years, and the seventh year was Jubilee time. And they were to be go. Now, if you came into that relationship with the, the master, then you were to be involved in, in going your way. But if your master gave you a wife and you had children by her, they were the master's. And under the old law, that's exactly what happened in Exodus, the 21st chapter. But here's what would happen. Wonder if that man says, no, I love my wife. I love my children. I'm going to stay and serve you. I'm not leaving on Jubilee Day. Then they would go before the judges. They say here, the God, those are the rulers. And they... They're taking all and pierce it to that man's ear to a doorpost. And he would be serving that man forever. Women, you got a love of a man like that? It's pretty special. <laughs> you dug my ear. I came to do thy will, O oh God. You pierced my ear. A body has been prepared. I came to do your will. And that's what I'm going to do. And he's going to give himself for the sins of the world. Romans the 8th chapter, verse 3, we find there's no condemnation in verse 1 that, uh, with, with Jesus Christ. Those of us are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life may be free from the law of sin and death and what the law could not do and that was weak through the what? The flesh. We'll find that it's Jesus who came. In the likeness of sinful flesh, he didn't know sin, but he came and identified with man. Not so I can get a little history lesson of how it's like to be with you. No, he knew that. He came to condemn sin in the flesh. That's how the rest of us ants are living. He came to condemn sin in the flesh. He lived the perfect life. In the flesh. He came to do the will of God in the flesh. He came to be that perfect sacrifice without blemish, without spot. It was going to be demanded if we're going to be saved from our sins. Why did you come to earth, oh Jesus? Because I want you to behold the glory of God. I'm here to save the lost. In order to do that, I'm going to die for the sins of mankind. And I'm going to have to live that perfect life under the law that no man's done. That's why he came to this earth. He came to suffer and die. And we see both of these points in Hebrews, the second chapter, in verses 14 through 18. Maybe not in the order that we're looking at it. But it's what happened. Because the children are sharers in flesh and blood, he took on that flesh and blood so he can know what it's like to be flesh and blood. No, 
it's so he could die. See, you've got to have a body to be separated from your spirit in order to die. If he's just a spirit, then that's not going to happen. But he's going to come in the flesh for all these purposes, but he's going to die. And the children are sharers in flesh and blood. That's your body. That's the physical side of you. He identified with that. Why? So he could bring to naught him that had the power of sin, that is the devil, the power of death, that is the devil. So you would not have to fear death any longer. Because it implies that Jesus would be raised from the dead. It was through death he brought to naught him that had the power of death. That is the devil, so we don't fear. And that is speaking about his death, but it's pointing us to his resurrection as well. Otherwise, if he just died, I'm still in my sins. I still fear death. That was the process. He took on flesh and blood so he could die. Not for angels. <laughs> but for man. In chapter, into in this chapter, he says he also there he suffered being tempted so he could be our high priest. Oh, he identified with us, didn't he? Yes. In fact, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, he wants you to come to his throne of grace to find grace and mercy in the time of need. What gives you the confidence that you can do that? It's because he did not sin. And he was involved in being the high priest because he suffered by that which he was tempted. He could identify with us, but victoriously so. Not that he needed that to know what's in us. But he conquered it so he could be a faithful high priest. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Did that take a body to do that? No. God is touched. The Holy Spirit is touched. He created us. But he lived the life so we could have confidence. You've been through this victoriously. I've got a little problem right now. I'm, I'm being tempted to do this. I'm being tempted to do that. I can go to the throne of grace. I don't have to get an appointment for him anytime. When I'm in need, he's there to help. That's our wonderful high priest. He suffered to be our high priest. He died to redeem us from our sins. And finally, he was raised from the dead. 1 Timothy 3, 16 speaks about this wonderful mystery. It's kind of in the form of a, of a, of a song. And it has some symmetry to it. It says... He was manifested in the flesh. He actually came in flesh and blood. But he was justified in the spirit. In the flesh, in Romans the first chapter, he identified with the seed of David. But being raised from the dead, according to the spirit, he was raised from the dead. And he was declared to be the son of God with power. In the spirit, he was justified. Then indeed, he was the son of God. And you put him to death, Jews, for what? Because he claimed to be the son of God. The resurrection said he is the son of God. He was justified in the spirit as he was raised from the dead. But see, but he was raised bodily. Remember when Jesus is speaking to his apostles on that resurrection day? They feared because they thought they saw a ghost in Luke 24 chapter. We saw a ghost. No, it's, it's me. Jesus, how did you go about proving it's you? Well, I just hovered around them like a little ghost and I just made them feel. They just feel it, huh? Because it's going to be a myth that I even existed. No. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Why show him his hands and why show him his feet? Because they had been pierced. Remember Thomas would be looking at that and said, my God, my God. 
The body that was hanging on the tree is the body that is standing before them resurrected from the dead. Why did God do that? Maybe to help us with the Jesus myth group today. But they don't let you look at this book. But we don't need that to show that it existed. I'm just telling you why. And Jesus manifested himself. He said, by the way, got anything here to eat? Got some fish? They didn't fry it. They brought it. They brought him broiled fish. And he ate it in front of them. Got a little ghost that does that? Human body does that. Human body has hands. Human body has feet. It's been pierced. This one whom we walked with has now been raised from the dead. Do you believe that Frederick Douglass had a wife? I do. This great man who knew from childhood what it was like the brutality of slavery. He knew it and he wrote about it. He was always recreating the fact that he's lived by writing just how brutal things were. But did he ever marry? Did he have a wife? Yeah, I'll tell you her name. It's Anna. She was born free in the Northeast. He wasn't. He escaped from the brutality of slavery. But they met up in Baltimore. They met up in Baltimore and she risked her whole life. But if they ever called her with him, we never heard of either one of them. But you don't hear much about Anna. Because, see, she never could read. So how does Frederick Douglass write letters to his wife who can't read? She never could read. I want to tell you something. She's some wife. How do you know? Because we've read letters documenting the, her name and documenting the fact that she existed and talked about what kind of mother she was from her children. But think about that life of that great man, Frederick Douglass, with all of his learning. Maybe not to be able to communicate with his wife like that, but she was a help meet to him in so many other ways. He was determined to have a family that he never had while he was growing up. But how do we know she existed? Historians are trying to dig up everything they can to try to understand this great woman called Anna. They don't have much to go on. No letters. She didn't write them. Did she exist? Yes. How do you know? I've read those who were closest to her. I have too. I got Jesus going through Jericho. A real city. Still is. I got in John the ninth chapter, which we didn't get to cover this morning. I got him coming and... and Man that's been kicked out of the synagogue. I did Jesus coming to heal that man that's born blind. I've got all of those events taking place. I've got Pontius Pilate. I've got Tiberius. I've got Luke documenting. They were the men that lived in his day. That walked with Jesus. And the letters that Jesus wrote were the Gospels. He inspired the men to write them. Is it wrong to look at the documentation of those who had lived closest to you to establish that you existed and it wasn't a figment of man's imagination? That's how we know Anna. 
And I don't find any people saying, well, Anna didn't exist. It's just a myth. Why would we say Jesus never existed? He had to. He had to come in the flesh. You took these five points. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And the next ones are dealing with what he did in the flesh. Came to behold his glory. He came to live the perfect life. He came to die in the flesh and then raise bodily. It's his flesh that he's setting before them. And we'll have to save another one to another time. But this morning, I want you to think about the fact that we have historical evidence from Jewish writers, from Roman historians, by name that Jesus Christ existed. Christians followed him. And that he was executed in the reign of Tiberius by Pontius Pilate. Definite names in history. He, and you know not only that he came and he existed, but those who were closest to him wrote about him. But what they tell you is why he came to this earth. Wonder if you haven't obeyed that gospel yet to be saved. Are you lost? Like Zacchaeus? I don't care who you are. You've got a soul. Either we're going, to, we're going to be lost or we're saved. And right now, if we're not in Christ, we're lost. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He gave his life. Not only to purchase us with his blood, but to take away the fear of death. That's what the devil has over us. We don't have to fear death when we're in him. Now we have the confidence that we can go to heaven when we die. Do you have that confidence? Maybe you're lost but you knew where you could come get some information to help you be saved like Zacchaeus did. If that's in your mind, let us help you be saved today. If we need to teach some more, we'll do some more teaching. But if you realize, I need to come to Christ in obedience. And I read, read my Bible, preacher, and I realize they repented and were baptized for the mission of their sins. I want to do that. Let us assist you. Come now as we stand and as we sing.